Uh, one thing you'll find out is that I think all of us are a little bit better uh, mechanically than we are electrically. I mean, I look at my grandchildren, they stack blocks. You know, so that, that block can, it, it, it can, it can bear a load, right? They don't stock, they don't stack their stockings, you know, their little balls of stocking, they stack blocks. And you know, the, uh, you know, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks realized that a big block can sustain a big load. In some cases, they're still around after thousands of years. So load bearing and cross section is another thing we're gonna talk about. For example, you know, if you, if you got a painting project, you grab a coat hanger, you bend it in a hook and you put it over your water line in your basement and it holds you know, the shutter that you're, that you're, uh, you're painting. Why did you pick, why did you pick the, the coat hanger? Why didn't you pick a piece of solder, for example? A solder, it looks like a, about the diameter of a coat hanger, but if you put it on the solder, it would just droop after time. So you do have basic knowledge of materials, it's just hopefully somebody hasn't you know, tied a lasso around it you know, for you. Um, so again, my hopes are that you're gonna leave here and some of the lingering questions you've had about materials will be answered and you'll say, hey, that wasn't a bad talk. Let me see if I can get this thing to work here. Oh, um, let me see. This MT level three, that stands for magnetic, magnetic testing. So, you know, magnetic particle testing. Uh, I'm a level three, so I can, teach the, I can teach magnetic particle training. Oh, uh, I thought these were gonna slide in. But anyway, okay, so what is steel? You know, by definition, it is basically iron with a carbon content that is, that is from nearly zero to a maximum of 2.1%. And very, very few steels are over 1%. One of, the, one of the more common steels you may have heard of it that's over 1% is 52100. That's what the 100 means, that it is over 1%. And also, uh, there's always a small amount of manganese in every steel that you buy. And you know, I'm kind of a, a guy who watches where the strategic materials are in this world, and the United States has zero zero pounds of manganese within our four shores. So we have to import everything. It comes from Australia, Russia, Rhodesia. So every pound of manganese we have to import. And when you see uh, a steel designated, all the elements that go into the production of the steel are expressed in weight percentage. And let me give you an idea what that means. If I had a a nearly 100 pound block of steel here, and I had, say, a 1040 material. That is, that those last two numbers actually have a decimal place in front of it, 0.40. So you could say out of a 100 pound block of steel, we'll make some allowances for the manganese, but there's only 0.4 pounds of carbon in that 100 pounds of steel. And it gives you an idea. Carbon is very, very powerful. It's the most powerful alloy element in steel. And this is why the AISI designations call that out. AISI, if you Google it, it stands for American Iron and Steel Institute. And basically their job is to devise classifications for irons and steels uh, for the United States. Now, if you ever get a cross-reference or if you get foreign steels, you know, the JIT, uh, you know, that's the Japanese, they have their own standards. And there's a lot of commonality between them, but AISI is just for the United States. And today, we're only gonna talk about plain carbon steels and alloy steels. Uh, some of you out there, you use tool steels. We're not gonna talk about them, but is there any tool steel that somebody likes, ha, has a preference for? Because I, I, I really, what do you got? What is it? M4. M4, what does the M stand for? Aha, you're just the guy I was looking for. <laughs> tool steels, I'm just gonna hit on this real quick. Tool steels, whoever came up with this was uh, a mental giant. A2, A6, A stands for air, 
it will harden in air. Heat it up red, put it in front of a fan, boom, it's hard. D, as in D2, that's dye steel. M stands for molybdenum. During World War II, we were cut off from all of our tungsten supply, which was in China. The Japanese had overrun China, and uh, we had to find another way to come up with a tool steel. The United States is sitting on the world's supply of molybdenum. That's why they call it Mali. It's easier to say. Anyway, so we came up with a high-speed steel, M4, which is also what they make high-speed drills out of sometimes, and the M stands for Mali. H, like H13, H21, those are hot work die steels. See, they're really smart. The first letter tells you, kind of gives you an idea what it is. What it is. S stands for shock. W stands for water. Okay, so, so it's water, water hardenable. So we're not going to talk about the, um, the die steels, but they have their own classification, and they don't exactly follow AISI. Uh, uh, now, I mean, they don't follow the AISI designations. Uh, in most cases, the steel is classified by using four and sometimes five numbers. The letters are sometimes added either in the middle or at the end. And you, sometimes you may see this like a, I've seen some 15B37. The B in the middle means they put some boron in it. And that, that's not the gasoline we used to buy in Ohio. But the B is a, is a big hardening, hardening uh, alloy, and we're going to talk about hardening alloys that have been a little bit. But they also indicate there's, there's something special about that, about that particular grade of steel when they put a letter in it. Some examples include, if you were using a, a 1004 steel, 10 basically says that it is a plain carbon steel and it has 0.04 pounds of carbon per 100 pounds. So very, very little carbon. And when I was in the stamping industry, we used these to deep draw an oil pan. Now, oil pans, a lot of those now are, are cast. But if you're going to have a deep drawing application, you're not going to use a 4340. You're not going to use a, a 52100. You're going to use something that is very, very ductile and pliable. A 1045, this is a common material used for shafts and wear pins. It likes to be water hardened, but you can also harden it in oil. We do a lot of that here at Cali's. Here I talked about a 15B37. This is a steel that has a manganese addition. You can see we've gone from the 10 to the 15. The 15 actually indicates that there's a manganese addition, so it's higher manganese. It's got some more alloy in it. It's got to be good for something, and that something is hardenability. The B stands for boron. This is what you make lawnmower blades out of. Uh, lawnmower blades are, are ridiculously difficult to heat treat. Uh, I did it when I was uh, working for a subsidiary of MPD, and uh, you know, if you ever hit a, a rock with your lawnmower blade, I've broken the crankshaft, but the lawnmower blade stayed in one piece. You know, if they broke, they'd probably go out and kill the neighbor's dog or something. But uh, this material is remar remarkably resistant to shock and impact when it's heat treated in a very, very peculiar way. 4340 is a very popular alloy for steels for crankshafts. 8620, a low alloy carburized and grade for camshafts, and it has a, a rather difficult cousin here of 9310, which is also used for uh, carburizing camshafts, but it's uh, considered a higher alloy. The alloy elements that strengthen steel are always expensive. They don't come cheap. These include chromium, nickel, molybdenum, and vanadium. When you put these in the steel, it's going to cost you some money. Now you're going to get something for it, but at a price. The challenge for any designer is to select the least expensive material that meets the demands of form, fit, and function. 
I know uh, one of my previous employers, uh, Caterpillar Tractor Company, they use a material that is, is, is so, so inexpensive that when it comes time to heat treat, they have to, heat, they have to quench, quench the thing using an accumulator tank and dump thousands of gallons on it per, per minute to get the thing to harden up. So they are really using the least expensive material for their crankshafts. Uh, steel making practices worldwide have never been better than they are today. I've had the opportunity to look at uh, aerospace standards, inspection standards, and you know, what, what's in those standards? A lot of these standards were written 40, 50 years ago when steel making practices weren't that good. All the, all the junky steel producers, they're gone. They're gone. We, we have a lot of mini mills out there that turn out an, an excellent product. And from a cleanliness standpoint, a repeatability standpoint, all these mills today, they're all top notch. And, that's, and since it is a worldwide market, even the ones in the Far East, are, are, they produce a good product. So how do we measure strength and ductility? The most popular method is to measure mechanical properties is the tensile test. And here we produce a tensile bar and we place it into a machine and we apply an increasing load. And we measure those loads continually until the tensile bar breaks. Uh, the test bar is stretched until it breaks and then we turn around and measure the bar and all this data is compiled with the load information to produce a certificate. And this is what one looks like. You take a, a sample and you machine a test bar. This is, you know, real simple here. And then we start to pull it, pull it apart, and the center starts to get a little thinner. And as it gets thinner and thinner, it'll eventually it'll break. And there's a, what they call a gauge length here that's usually about two inches. And when this is all done, they put the, they put the two pieces back together and they measure the overall length. So on your steel certificate, this will now say the percent elongation. That tensile bar stretched a certain percent over that two inch gauge through the, through the, the, the entire test. They'll, they'll then measure this reduction of area from, from here to here, and they'll report that as the reduction of area. That's, what that, that's how ductile that material was. They also, when they keep applying the tension, they know when it broke. And that's the ultimate tensile strength. They know exactly what, what load the, the, the material broke at. And then they, they graph all this, and I'm calling this a, a generic tensile test. And this is true for any steel. If you load a steel, uh, if you load, a, 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 it doesn't matter if it's a tensile bar, it doesn't matter if it's a crankshaft, it doesn't matter what it is, it'll, it'll operate within this elastic range. And if you, if you take the load off, everything will go back to zero. You know that's true with a coat hanger. You can bend a coat hanger, but if you bend it too far, it takes a set. And when you bend it too far, that's this point right here. And they, 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 put it, they put a Y there because that's where it's yielded. And now you're into the plastic region. And the, the coat hanger or the test specimen will continue to bear a load until it gets to the maximum load. And they report this as the tensile strength. And then it'll eventually it'll fracture as it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So all these calculations, all these physical constants go into your certification. Now, down here it also says a 0.2% offset. They report that by convention because here is a generic tensile test for something that's brittle. It goes, it follows the same slope of the line, but as you load it, it doesn't do any of this, it doesn't deform, it just breaks, okay? 
So they put this 0.2% in there because some materials don't have a clearly de defined yield point. So by convention, they say this is, this is a 2% offset. And I guess I really didn't describe this, this graph very well. Here we're putting stress. This is a load on the part, and this is the strain. In other words, how far is it actually stretching? So this is load versus stress versus strain. And there is a difference between hardness and hardenability. I kind of mentioned this earlier. Hardness, by definition, is the resistance to penetration under specified conditions of a load and an indenter. That indenter can be a diamond indenter, it can be a, a, a ball indenter. Uh, for steels, we talk a lot about Rockwell hardness, which is a, a, of a known load of 150 kilograms on a uh, pyramidal um, uh, diamond indenter. Hardenability, on the other hand, is the ability of a steel to achieve a certain hardness to a given depth. And this is only after suitable heat treatment because you don't buy the material, sometimes you buy the material preheat treated, but ordinarily you machine it and then you send it out for hardening and that gives you the desired mechanical properties your design is calling for. And hardness can be measured in steels in any condition. Hardenability presumes that the steel will be heat treated to achieve the targeted hardness at a given depth. Here, point number one, the AISI designations provide information about the obtainable hardness. And this is another one of these, you know, poor design left type of revelations that I had early on. The last two numbers always indicate the carbon content. And the carbon content dictates the hardness. And I don't care what material it is, whether it's a a 1050, a 4150, a 4350, that 50 points of carbon, if you look, it will establish the hardness. And again, this is always expressed in weight percentage, and the steels display increasing hardness with increasing carbon contents up to about 50.50, like half a pound per 100 pounds of steel. And I've got a slide here that, that'll show you that after 50 points of carbon, your hardness basically plateaus off. And all steels in, uh, display an increase in strength with an increase in carbon. So carbon is just, it's just overall the most powerful alloy element in a steel. What I want to, I skipped the slide here. Uh, the hardness versus carbon content, and again, this is true for all steels. These are the things I want you to put in your vest pocket and remember. This is the carbon content across the bottom, and this is the Rockwell hardness. And you can see, nothing gets to 70. If somebody tells you you got Rockwell 70, you know, they're, they're, you know they don't have both oars in the water, okay? You can start down here, a Rockwell 20, and below, that's not a good number. That, that's why they have this kind of dash down here. But as the carbon content increases, the hardness increases up to about 50. And you, and you can see here, it starts to flatten out. So if you go from, say, a 1020 material up to a 1040 material, you can see you could get an increase in hardness of you know, maybe 10 points. Now, you don't get that for free. Sometimes the design is such that, whoops, maybe I cracked it or it won't last as long. You know, I used a 30 instead of a 40 carbon. So this is where it's always a compromise. What grade of steel you pick? Let me go back one now. Carbon is the most powerful alloy element because it's so small, it actually gets inside the atomic makeup of the steel. And I could spend probably three hours talking about that, but I don't want to. <laughs> and it also links up with other alloy elements. If you have chrome, for example, it loves chrome. Chrome and, and, uh, and carbon love one another. Uh, also, 
I think I talked about this a couple of times, how very little carbon it takes to really impact the physical properties of steel. Here's one that I think is going to open up a few eyes. Remember I said that all materials follow this same modulus of elasticity until they start to yield. And the only difference here is, number one, the carbon, it is the carbon content. So if you have a 4130 material, it actually has a good, clear, distinct yield point, and it shows some good ductility. Add 20 points of carbon to it, and look how much stronger it becomes, but you don't have the ductility. Again, no free lunch. It's always a compromise. You sacrifice strength for ductility. And point two, the first two numbers on the AIS, AISI designation, they talk about what the alloy grade is. Alloys are added to steel for two reasons to alter its mechanical properties, and also to increase corrosion resistance. But we're not gonna talk about corrosion resistance. We're, we're now getting into stainless steels and that kind of thing. We're only gonna talk about how it alters the mechanical properties. And the higher hardenability means the deeper the hardness will go from the surface after heat treatment. And again, here I'm, I'm telling you what I'm telling you, and I'm gonna tell you again, and tell you again, and hopefully when you walk out of here, you're going to put that in your vest pocket. And the higher hardenability of alloy steels allows these material to support higher loads with thinner cross sections. And boy, that sounds like something a designer would really want to have. How can I support a heavier load with a thinner cross section? Some of the more popular alloy steel grades. Here, this 15, the XX, that's where the carbon content would be. But if you look up, I'm sure it's in a machinist handbook, and you just say, what is the 15 series, or 1500 series of steel? It basically is plain carbon steel, and we added a little more manganese to it. The 41 series, it's a chromoly steel. Good stuff, right? But if you add a little bit of nickel to it, it even becomes stronger and better. So these first two numbers are basically framing in the composition of the alloy elements. And the last two numbers, of course, are the carbon content. 51, this is a medium chromium steel, and 86 is a low nickel chromium moly steel. And if you look these up in the book, you'll see that there's compositional limits that may vary a little bit, but this is basically the pedigree for what that alloy grade can do for you. So what does all this mean to an engine part maker or an engine builder? The material selection, I've always said it, it's a balancing act. A compromise where strength, increasing strength gives you less ductility. And with less ductility, the part may break before it bends. We've all seen that. It just snapped. One of the ones I love is uh, it recrystallized. Anyone ever heard say, oh, the material, it recrystallized. Or it's made out of pot metal. <laughs> I, I really don't know what that means. You know, it recrystallizes pot metal. These are common uh, failure analysis terms that you got to deep dive it a little bit more to get to the root cause. And of course, the cost of the higher alloy may be prohibitive. You know, there's certain alloys that I think only the government can use that, I mean, they're, they're borderline impervium. I mean, I don't know where they get this stuff, but it goes into some of the, you know, the weapons projects and that kind of thing. I know we had a piece come in and, you know, I could tell just by handling it, the thing had a bunch of tungsten in it. And uh, of course, for us to buy a bill of that would probably cost, you know, five, eight thousand dollars. So it's cost prohibitive. And the knowledge of how each component in, in the engine is loaded and their failure mode are a must when you're picking out a material. You know, for example, crankshafts, 
They can bend in a con they can fail in a combination of bending and torsion. Camshafts, they like to fail normally through roller contact fatigue. So knowing those failure mechanisms drives you to pick the material and the heat treatment for the proper application. And again, heat treatment is always required to get the final mechanical and wear properties out of your component. Connecting rods, they're exposed to a variety of loads. And the most common failure mode in the connecting rod is bending. And you know, I have to admit, I have seen some connecting rod failures that are probably the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life because when those puppies go, you know, and I don't know how many RPM these things are flying around, but it just beats everything to hell. But, oop. but unlike crankshafts, a popular material for connecting rods is 4330. It still has the 43, but the 30 brings that, that hardness down a little bit, but it also gives the material a little more toughness, a little more ductility. And connecting rods are normally through hardened and are given no surface treatment. You know, you won't find, you know, a, an induction hardened connecting rod or a nitride connecting rod. There's no reason to. Here's a, uh, a quick word about heat treat. You know, it's, been, it's put food on the table for me for many years, but heat treatment is a necessary evil. Nobody heat treats because they want to. You know, this was my father's business and I used to hear it at the dinner table all the time. They heat treat because they have to. And once you put heat to a part, you know, it, who knows, you get distortion, you get cracking, Hopefully, most of the time, you get the desired properties that you want. But again, nobody does it because they want to. Uh, heat treatment gives the once easy to machine uh, steel its final desired mechanical properties. You just don't get it by, when you're done machining it, putting it on the shelf. You have to heat treat it. And many in our industry view heat treatment as a black art one that periodically ruins expensive parts. And I know I've ruined my share in the past. And <laughs> you know, you say, whoops, what did I do wrong? And uh, one of the things about metallurgy is that it's, one of, it, it's the most observed of all the engineering disciplines. In other words, it's, it's almost like you're a cook. You use these ingredients and you cook it for so long, at this temperature for so much time, and it should turn out, okay? But every once in a while, you know, the cake didn't rise, it, it, it drooped. And when that happens, you know, we metallurgists sometimes, you know, look at our shoes and we hunch our shoulders and we say, hey, what can we say? You know, most of the times it should be that way. Not the answer some people are looking for, but again, it's all observation, it's all empirical. If we do these things, it should turn out. Sometimes it doesn't. And knowledge of materials, applied stresses, and geometry need to be combined, combined with the proper heat treatment in order to produce a durable and reliable engine component. Uh, back when I was with uh, Cummins Engine Company, we did a study and we, this before Taguchi methods were popular, uh, we, 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 we called it a, a factorial test. We took different materials and different heat treatments and, 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 and different geometries. And what we found out, the number one reason to, to reduce the life of the crankshaft in fatigue was geometry. If you've got a sharp tool mark or a radius that's not blended, properly, and you, that's a stress riser. Just like cutting glass, you score it, it'll break right there. So all, the, all the, the best materials in the world and the best heat treatment in the world don't add up to anything if your design is bad or your manufacturing methods need a little attention. 